Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Welcome, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Ah, well, you know, you kind of get res- <laughs> I think I'm used to the beatings by now. What is it, 6 1 tonight, Bruce? 6, six one? 1 1. I got one. 6 1. 18 grade A chances for the Leafs. Oh. Eight. For the orders, the third game in a row, the orders have had eight grade A chances. Bruce, Bruce, they averaged 13 a game heading in, 13 grade A chances a game. The Leafs held them to eight each game. Um, I think it's the lowest scoring chance total for the orders was is eight this year, if I'm not mistaken. They had one seven to seven against mm-hmm. Ottawa, the one oh, where they got the four nothing lead yeah. on a bunch of grade B goals, and then they called off the dogs. That's what they uh, needed to against the Leafs with some grade B chances going in they couldn't even get their grade a's and so just just eight again and uh hell of a the, the toronto maple leafs that is one hell of a team right now if, based on those three games they absolutely dominated the edmonton oilers and uh the oilers weren't close in any of them they were not close in any of them all right bruce this is our two good things two numbers two bad things and two numbers podcast uh did you have a good thing tonight? Yeah, uh, my good thing is that Kyler Yamamoto lived. And this was a really, really, really scary incident in the first period where uh, he was bending over trying to play a puck and uh, uh, Leon Dreisaitl's skate got caught up in between the puck and I think Yamamoto's stick or somebody's stick and they were just battling right off the face-off circle. And Leon's skate boot came up and basically booted Yamamoto right in the face, under you know, with the right around the uh, in the face area, and thankfully the blade of the skate went on the other side of the visor, and only the the boot got him. And Yamamoto went off. And he'd already gone down the tunnel once, having taken a shot in the hand and the or a pass in the in the hand, and then next thing you know he's back out there, and the next thing you know he's back on the bench, feeling if he's still got a nose or not. I mean, if there'd been a if that had been the skate blade side that had come up there, that would have been really bad, really bad. So, at that point, I said to my wife, "Whatever else else happens tonight, that didn't happen." And I sort of became almost numb to the carnage that followed on the on the ice terms. At least it was, you know, <laughs> there was nothing uh, uh, nothing grotesque on the injury front. It was one of those plays that it really could have gone as they say, sideways, which really means downhill off a cliff. Uh, anyway, so that's my good thing. Hey, yeah, Kyler um, Yamamoto, you're still with us, man. <laughs> and Kyler Yamamoto was part of the only orders line that I thought played the Leafs even tonight. In fact, they were even on goals. They were out for one against and on for one, and this is the dynamite line. Finally reunited, Bruce. And today I did a post just digging into how those players had done Um since they'd been broken up last mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. And I just want to uh, go through those numbers right sure. now really quickly. Let me just, let me just find the post post, but so, so, suffice it to let's, we'll just start out by saying each of those players had all of them, dry side Nugent Hopkins and Yamamoto had had a significant drop in every offensive category after getting broken up. And mm-hmm. um, Connor McDavid, who the move was made, I think to, to help and benefit, he really didn't have much improvement at all. So what we saw was um, Nugent Hopkins in the 28 games last season when he was with the Dynamite line had 27 points in 28 games. In the 24 games with McDavid, he had seven. Just even strength, right? Even strength post yeah. points, yes. Uh, Yamamoto had 22 in 25 games with the Dynamite line. Without Nugent Hopkins, he had 10 points even strength in 24 games this year. So less than half the points. Nugent had about mm-hmm. a third of the point. And Dreisaitl, um, his his point scoring was also down significantly. His grade A shots, Bruce Dreisaitl's grade A shots, he had a quarter of the grade A shots, the rate of grade A shots in his first 24 games that he had had when he was with the, the Dynamite line. So, you know, um, it was great that they were reunited by the coach. It, it, it didn't obviously make a difference in this game very much, but it was the one Oilers line that had any kind of... Uh, attacking prowess they scored a they scored a really nice goal 
Um, they had a couple other really good scoring, grade A scoring chances and were easily the best Oilers line. And they, I think the only one that remained intact through the game. So we'll see what happens. Um, you know, the Connor McDavid needs good line mates. I think, yes, a Puglio RV is a, a really good line mate for Connor McDavid. They're going to have to find another one. And I don't know if that's Dominic Cahoon. He'd be my first pick to, to give a go there. There's, of course, there's Dylan Holloway coming, um, from, um, uh, U.S. college hockey, I think, uh, at some point this year. But the Oilers, they might have, they might be looking to move a defenseman for a forward um, somewhere along the way here. That's where the Oilers have a surplus of players. Now, tonight's game might not be the best game to send to a prospective team in terms of looking at acquiring an Oilers defenseman, Bruce. But uh, They yeah. sure missed Evan I, Bouchard, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. My good thing, moving on, sorry, I, that was a kind of a long uh, um, seg, uh, added information, but I just wanted to get that on the record. Uh, Adam Larson is my good thing, Bruce. Uh, he was the only defenseman on the Oilers who had even strength, didn't make a major mistake on a grade A chance against. Tyson Berry made five, Caleb Jones made three, Nurse two, Bear three, Russell made four. Larson made none, and he, he, he also... He was also just really tough and really physical bodies. in this game. Oh. He was the only Oilers defenseman, honestly. Mm-hmm. This is missing from the Oilers. Like, you, this is the thing. You go with all these puck-moving defensemen, and suddenly you're not hitting as hard. They, William Lagas and Bruce, the second he's healthy, he's in the lineup, and I think he's, you know, we'll see if he's in the lineup to stay, but he's in the lineup. He's earned it because he's exactly the kind of rock-solid defenseman that they're, that they're missing right now who can also, who can also move the puck. So Larson uh, had six hits, um, Archibald six, Jujar Kara 12. Uh, but uh, just, I thought, a strong game from Adam Larson. He had a few glitches on the, on the uh, shorthanded. But other than that, um, was a bright light in a dark place. Yeah, Kara, he, well, Larson and Kara double-teamed um, John Tavares one time. Yeah. Larson sent him skidding into the corner and then... Uh, Kara came in and finished the job, and they were they were not taking any prisoners. Those two guys, the three of them, counting Archibald, uh, but um, uh, Larson stood out more to me for just the fact he was playing defense. I mean, the the, the defensive effort of the Oilers defenders was putrid, and not just the defenders. But I'm not single them out for a moment. But uh, well, have we gotten to my bad thing yet? <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, the defensive effort of the Oilers' rear guards was putrid, is my bad thing. And it, it was, uh, and, not, and not just the defenders, it was it was a bad game, but uh, there was just so many breakdowns on the back end and so many times that, that Mike Smith was left alone against a pack of wolves. And, you know, two men in on him alone or... or uh, I mean, there was that one goal where the two guys came in two on zero, and, and Joachim Niegaard comes flying back to make a great play to check the guy, the would-be goal scorer, and he checks the puck right to the other guy, and he stuffs it in the net. I mean, sometimes it's just not your night. But it was uh, uh, just it was it was hard to watch. I'll I'll single out. I know you're going to talk about one of these guys in particular, so I, I'll talk about another one. Caleb Jones. He had one shift in the third period. Where he had the puck on a stick four times in a row in the Oilers' end with a chance to clear it. And he coughed it up up the wall the first time. Uh, the second time he failed to get it out, um, got, his pass got intercepted in the zone. The third time he finally got a clean look, at, but he kind of whiffed his pass and he sent this muffin up that got intercepted. Well, it actually hit hit the stick of the target player, but it was, uh, it was kind of a broken play and the puck came right back into Edmonton's zone. So then Jones recovers the puck, and he holds it, and he actually does everything right for a few seconds. The whole rest of the team goes off for a line change. He holds the puck because Toronto's changing. He does the full Russell reset. Everybody on the ice is fresh except him. And then he comes up to the blue line with the puck, and then he completely flubs it. He got his stick jammed in his skates or something. The puck didn't even make it to the blue line, and in comes Toronto with it again with the Oilers scrambling. And that one resulted in a huge 
10 alarm fire around the crease where Caleb Jones, to his credit, he was the one who kept it out of the net. They had to look at the replay two or three times. Smith was diving around and Puck wound up landing just outside the net and just past the goal line after uh, multiple reviews. They determined it wasn't in the net, but the whole shift, I mean, make a pass, man. I mean, that's what you're there for. Make yeah, Bruce, a pass. as a, as a, uh, as a beer league defenseman who who makes about one such terrible de- passing <laughs> gaff a night or a shift, I had a lot of sympathy for Caleb Jones on that one. Uh, geez, well, there was yeah. three. That was three. He yeah. had four yeah. turnovers, and I'm pretty sure we'll find three of them on that one shift Absolutely. in the play. Well, there's, there's a couple of shifts I like the even less Bruce in, in mm-hmm. some ways from Jones. Like the the there was a just slide a, by. Oh uh, no! I'm in the, the first goal? period on the goal. Uh, mm-hmm. The first lead goal that goes right through Caleb Jones, you know, like Spezza passes it right through him, um, mm-hmm. cross, cross the crease. And, um, man, you can't have, you, you can't have that. And then the starfish, which yeah. if Chris had done it, if Chris, what would be, what, Bruce, what would have been the reaction on Twitter if Chris Russell had made that starfish play? I asked myself that same question, David, but I didn't dare put it out on Twitter because Chris Russell's played 800 games and Caleb Jones has played around 80. Uh, so there's part of it being the learning experience, but you know, you know, and I know that he would have been pilloried and, and, uh, uh, or else maybe he would have just made the play because it's one thing he does when the starfish is that quite often it actually works out, even if you don't like it. Yes. As a he might have made the play, whereas, and Jones came close to making the play to give Caleb yeah. Jones, you know, it, it's, this is a tough play. And, there's a debate about leaving your feet or not. It's obviously an Oilers tactic. The, the coaches, mm-hmm. yeah. they're they're encouraging it, right? And it works. A lot of the time, they, it works. They do it on the penalty kill all the time. Every Oilers defenseman on the penalty kill, if there's a, any kind That's of a right. chance down of low. a cross slot pass from down low, the weak side defenseman lays down on the ice to to try and take it away, and they're they're all doing it. So it's clearly a, uh, a coach thing. Yes. This one was more an emergency. Let's make the hero play. Let's pretend that we're TJ Brody and we have a puck magnet in our stick so that it never misses the puck when we slide across. But whoa, it's us. It didn't turn out that way. And into the net she went again. It's a, it's a, as they say, it's the sliding on the on the penalty kill is a, a feature, not a bug. Mm-hmm. And and they're also, they also have that thing where they, where when a shooter gets it on the half wall, they'll let him move in and take a shot, quite often seems to me that the owners are looser and on and, and allowing that shot than other teams are. And, and, you know, they're counting on the defenseman to get out there and block that shot. They don't always block it. Nurse didn't block one and it went in yeah. on the power play. I think that was, is that what this was at the sixth goal? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Uh, well, there was a one, that was the one that the shot came through and it hit Hyman. He was behind everybody. And he had enough time to both yeah, shoot and right. cash yeah. the rebound. Zach so. Hyman, he's a good hockey player, eh? He looks like he looks. Oh, he, of course, the Oilers made him look player. like Gordie Howe, but uh, he's a tremendous player. He's a good player. I've never seen that guy bad. Like he's, uh, oh yeah. You know, he doesn't score a million goals, but he's, uh, you know, he 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 uh, has a, a full set of skill. Like th- Toronto's third line in this series. Uh, that they have with Engvall, Mikheyev, and, and Hyman. And they played together most oh. of the games. There was a little more mixture tonight, I think. But uh, they were dominant. It didn't matter if they were playing McDavid's line, Dreisaitl's line, or the Oilers' bottom six. They were in the ascendant all uh, all series long. They have, my brother's a Leafs fan. Oh, sorry to hear that. Has been his whole life. I used to be as a kid, but then I moved to Edmonton, and then we got a team. So, But uh, and he said that, it gives Toronto a terrific matchup advantage to have a third line like that because they can, the coach can put them out there on the road, defensive zone, no matter who's coming over the boards, he's happy that he's got a decent matchup. He, he hasn't got a bottom six that might get shellacked by stars on the other team. They, you know, and We sure saw it in these three games. Nobody on Toronto got shellacked by anyone on Edmonton. Speaking of that third line, um, my bad thing is Ethan Bear. This game um, just looked lost at sea, Bruce. He, he and and it started early in the game. Mikhaev from that line comes charging down the wing, and 
Ethan Bear, by NHL standards, is is an average skater at best. I think um, he gets by because he has a very high hockey IQ last year, and he was very sharp. But to me, um, well, Bruce, the way we count scoring chances, he's made the highest rate of mistakes on grading scoring chances all year. He hasn't seemed to be right all year long. And, and the last few games that since he's come back from his concussion, it was, is that what it was? He, he, he has not, we don't know had, for sure, but we're not. Okay. But he, he is not, by a puck. he has not looked good at all to me. And, um, Mikhaev just, you know, Ethan Bear can handle that kind of player when he's playing his a game, but he, when he's playing his D game, that's not going to happen. And that guy just shot past him down the wing early in the game. And it was just the first, um, mistake that we saw this the second one and it's and it's kind of a confusing one and i'm not 100 percent sure i have this right because it's kind of mystifying this is the leafs second goal on the absolutely horrific line change by the oilers and it comes down it's it's not the forwards it's either it's it's um larson gets off the ice and bear doesn't get on the ice and if you're watching it you can see bear standing up and looking at the coaches and addressing the coaches on the bench as larson's getting off the ice um like could larson have got off the ice a little quicker that's one thing i don't know but it's not the player coming off the ice's job to yell onto the bench hey get on the ice for me that's the player on the bench Mm -hmm. and the coach so this is between bear and the coaches and i don't know who effed up completely, but Bear's the player involved. So I'm, I have to put that on Ethan Bear, but it's a terrible mistake because it led to the crucial second goal of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Game winner. How did you, did you see that the same as I saw oh, that? Oh yeah. I, I, I went, I backed it up. They showed a replay after of the change on the forward side, but that wasn't where the problem was. It was on the defensive no. side. So yeah. I went back to the real time action and the puck was scrambled around in the center zone and for whatever reasons, just like you say, uh, Bear stood up on the bench. He turned sideways. He put his hand in the air. It's like he was asking for a water bottle or something. I don't know. Uh, but looking towards the Toronto end of the ice, Larson's coming in behind him. He can't see Larson, but it was a fairly clear-cut case where the Oilers were just kind of going to try and get the puck in deep and then change. I mean, so what he was calling for, I don't know, because his shift was coming right up. But... Maybe he thought it was Barry's shift next. I don't know, David. I don't know what's what's going on, but that was uh, that was a that was a real mess. That one, and it wound up being a two-on-zero breakaway, which tells me there's more than just one guy that messed up when the other team gets a two-on-zero. Because even if that guy is there, it's still a two-on-one, right? So yeah, where were the other guys? It was uh, wound up being poor uh, Joachim Nigard who came back to make that check. And like I say, it was just really unlucky for him that he checked it straight to the other Toronto guy and he popped it home. It looked like, anyway, it might have been a pass. I haven't seen a definitive angle, but it looked to me like Negard made a desperation sweeping check off his Spezza and it just bounced right to uh, Jimmy VC, who got his Nurse. revenge on Alex Chase yeah. on tonight in a major way. Nurse might have held the middle of the ice on that one. He kind of got over to the side and and uh um it's not not yeah. anyway he was in a tough spot too well moving on with bear um mm-hmm. next comes a power play a couple minutes later and he's late on a, he's late to the shooter in the slot um and um we get a goal and then um two minutes a couple minutes after that this is a very bad stretch for ethan bear uh we have i think he gets beat I'm just trying to remember the play. There's so many bad plays on the orders here tonight. I think he gets beat down the wing, uh, and a puck goes into the puck goes into the middle of the ice. Uh, there's a rebound, and, and Nurse is slow to the shooter this time. So just a. And then right after that, he took a penalty when he couldn't get the puck out, and he wound up grabbing the guy along the boards, and it was just a just a sequence where where I just. It couldn't have gone much worse. It was uh, I was uh, it was yeah. painful to watch. As a, as yeah. a huge fan of Ethan Bear, that was a, one of the toughest stretches of hockey that I personally have watched in quite a while because he just looked overwhelmed out there. Yeah, Bruce, I'm not. You know, in terms of the Oilers' defenseman mix, at this point, I'm really not happy with Bouchard sitting out, and it's speak. <sighs> 
to me, it speaks to too conservative a coaching approach. If I'm completely honest, I just, I just think you have a player who's clearly a game changer. And how many times tonight, when the puck went back back to the point, did I wish it, wish it was going back to Evan Bouchard as compared to any of the other Oilers defensemen other than Tyson Berry who are out there? He's Bouchard is just able to make a play in that situation on the blue line, walking the blue line, making a little movement, making a smart move into the zone, uh, protecting the puck, whatever, you know, a number of tricks that he's got. And it just didn't happen at all tonight. And it was one of the reasons the Oilers were unable to generate offense. And I know he had a few iffy plays, but they were just a few iffy plays. There was an overall bad play by Evan Bouchard that, that we saw in the last game. And um, I just... They, they, they've got to make up their mind they're going to go with him, I think, and stick with him and play him. Mm-hmm. And it, it could mean, you know, maybe trading another defenseman for a forward. If you have a need at forward, move one of these guys. You got, you're going to have to make a choice here. And um, you might even get it wrong. Let's, you know, if you're trading one of, let's say, Bear, Jones, or Logason, or Tyson Barry, um, those would be the candidates that I would group together you, you could make a mistake in in uh trading one of those players but i think you have to you got to open up a, a space for evan bouchard or at least you got to play evan bouchard so anyway that's my bad it's a double bad thing you know bear was was so poor and i just i just kept thinking of bouchard and how much you know mm. we could have we would have expected more from bouchard i think we would have got it and the, the coach has got to have some faith in this player yeah, well, he played one game of the three against Toronto, and, and he was, you know, he was burned on that uh, uh, in that first period. I remember we talked last game about how the Oilers actually dominated the play while he was out there after, yeah. you know, after the horse was stolen. But it, it was um, uh, he was in the press box for the other two games, and they got clobbered in those games also. So maybe get him back in there. I'm not yeah. sure about trading someone, David. I think you need eight defensemen, but you need to have uh, uh, you need to have your better ones in the lineup and playing. And well, you see, I I have a lot of faith in Lenstrom as an eighth. Like if you have an eighth D man and he's Theodore Lenstrom, because okay. I I just think you have a bigger need at forward right now. And um, I'm I'm not completely sure about it either, Bruce. You don't have to think through all the ramifications, but right. you know this is the odd because it's not just that they have. If you include Lenstrom, which I do, nine defensemen right now who can play in the NHL, they've also got Brobury coming. They've got Sam Rukov coming. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so th- there is a there is a need. I think at some point you just have to say, okay, we've got a bigger need at forward. We've got a surplus of defensemen. We're going to get into this. We're going to do a podcast on Friday morning, and we'll get into. Uh, and I'll I'll have thought this right. through a little bit more by then. Bruce, what's your number? <sighs> Yeah, my number is the elephant in the room. One four thirteen against, three game homestand, uh, with first place supposedly on the line. The Oilers are now ten points back, and there's absolutely zero chance of first place. And honestly, uh, this trio of defeats are so crushing. I wonder how the team bounces back in the next short while, because they uh, they looked like a badly beaten club tonight, and I didn't see a whole lot of team spirit, frankly. I was expecting a, a a game with more edge to it. There was some hitting, but it didn't, you know, the, the stuff that happened at the end of last game, there was no real carryover from that other than uh, Mike Smith going after uh, uh, Zach Hyman a couple of times, you know, but it was, uh, uh, they just didn't seem to, they, they, they I hate to get into, cliches like wanting it or competing or stuff but there were times in that game where Toronto just had their complete way with Edmonton there was times in all three games where Toronto had their way with Edmonton and to be that badly embarrassed on your home ice three games are all fans or no fans I mean there was one point where the when, when they finally scored and the, and one of the announcers said the, the home fans would be giving the orders a boost right now. And I said to my wife, all I, to give them a boost, all they'd have to be doing is add the T. Because <laughs> they already would have been giving them the booze. But it was because it was such a such a sad display up to that point. But uh, I'm kind of discouraged, frankly. I mean, 
three shellackings in a row, and Toronto was dominant team in all three games. Like, there was no question who was better. And the Oilers knew it. I mean, that's the worst part, was they knew it. Bruce, and I'd be Their top more stars down. didn't have it. Um, Go ahead. Sorry. Well, their top stars didn't have it, but I think we're going to talk about that with your number a little bit. I'd be more down if the Oilers hadn't played really well up until now, including the first four games against Toronto. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm still processing what happened here it was clearly just the dominant like so the grade a scoring chances for the three games total were 39 to 24 the Leafs should have won probably all three games but if you break that down to goals that that's not 13 to 1 that's 10 to 6 that's 10 to 6 so so some of the issue was goaltending and which is a weird thing to say because the Leafs had their you know backup and their second backup they used all three of their goals they used and, and Smith wasn't actually that bad tonight he at least but in the first two games, goaltending was an issue for the Oilers in both games. And so I'm just still, I, I just, I, I, but it's hard to. But offense, Dave? I know, Bruce. I, well, for one thing, how many power plays did they get in the three games? Well, they had none in two different games. In the second game, when they finally got around to give them a power play, they canceled it after three seconds. I remember that. I think they actually got two clear power plays later in that game. None tonight to five against. But uh, after the first game, when they had none to one against, uh, Drysaddle said they hadn't really drawn any. And tonight, there, there was one time I was kind of ticked at the ref, and it was like five seconds into the second period when uh, Muzzin coughed the puck up at the Toronto Blue Line, and Yamamoto jumped at it and got behind him. And Muzzin just gave him that old professional little spin around, you know, just to grab him around the hip. And, and it was going to be a two-on-one yeah, Yamamoto and, and Nugent Hopkins, and instead... It wound up going nowhere, and I was one where, you know, it was subtle, but I mean, the one they called on Chris Russell the other night was pretty subtle, and, you know, it was one they, was the score one nothing maybe changes things, a power play would have helped, you know, like, one power play is too much to ask, but tonight it was, but anyway, that's, that's, for the most part, Toronto had the puck most of the time, and that's why the Oilers were taking the penalties. Let's go to my number, because it does kick off kind of this... You know, because because one of the things that went wrong in this ser- in this series is Connor McDavid's play. He got no points, right? Mm-hmm. First time in his career, no, three straight games without a point, and that all uh, turns out so, to be a three game series. So, Bruce, in the first uh, twenty two games of the season, Connor McDavid made a major contribution to one hundred and thirty three grade A scoring chances, t- which is an amazing amount, amazing total. That's he's a- he's ad- ad- averaging. A major contribution to a grade A chance six times per game. This is this is uh, one. He, he was at five point one last year. He's at six point zero this year. I mean, Drysaddle in his MP, MVP was at four point nine major contributions to grade A chances per game. So McD- McDavid was at six. It's just the the highest level of offensive performance we've ever seen from him. Against the Leafs, he was in on seven grade A chances in three games, and that's two point three per game. So um, the offense was just rare, very rarely there for Connor McDavid. He was not combining well with his line mates, which led to the breakup of, of take, you know, taking Nugent Hopkins off his line to see if it, they could get them going. I think it actually worked with Nugent Hopkins and, and that line, but it didn't work with McDavid. They have an issue of who they're going to play with him. I don't really, I'm not... You know, the, the other teams, when you, when you, it just shows, and we've seen this in the past, when you have a really disciplined defensive team, when you have an excellent defensive team, you're able to shut down Connor McDavid. San Jose did it, remember, in that series. In the playoffs, McDavid had a hard time against that team with Mark Edward mm-hmm. Vlasic. Right, I remember There's that. some defensemen that are just, they don't have to be big Bobby Clobbers. They're, they're often really smart, fast defensemen, and... Um, Muzzin, I think I'm not sure who played the most against McDavid, but they're you know there's they have a number of them on the Leafs. They have Muzzin, they have Hall, Justin Hall, uh, Brody, they have Brody. Brody, he kept yeah, Brody, the stick in there and breaking yeah. up the play over and over again. So they have these defensemen on this team, a number of them who are able to to deal with McDavid, and then you have a team that has good defensive structure and a real commit commitment to playing defense. And and what he does so well, he is a human highlight reel. Um, but he's also sometimes a, a one-man band, and that works against 90% of NHL teams and players. But you're going to get the players that are really good fundamentally defensively. 
um, the very best at the highest level. And Toronto seems to have acquired them. Good, good for them. And they, they shut down McDavid. The only way you're going to beat that kind of play, Bruce, is with combination play, which is why the, I think the dynamite line did better against the Leafs than any other Oilers line. So McDavid needs to find some line mates. I think Pugliarvi is one of those line mates. Mm-hmm. And I, so, you know, the candidates, it's not James Neal and it's not Josh Archibald. It might be Tyler Annis. It might be Dominic Cahoon of, of the players on the lineup or Joachim Nygaard, who, who had in a very small sample size last year, they were out for six goals, four, two against, and might have the speed to help on the four check. But they're going to have to find that player who can fit with McDavid. And it might be in a trade. Or there's also Dylan Holloway coming in. Yeah, well, McDavid was involved in two chances tonight, and they were both in the third period with the game long since decided. One was where he fished the puck out from behind the net, and it kind of took a double ricochet, and Ennis nearly stuffed it in on the far side, but not exactly a a, 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 a fabulous play, but it worked out not bad. And the other one was a a very late pass to Yasipul Yarvi at sort of the hash mark for for a one-timer that, was fairly easily turned aside, you know, it was within the grade A chance area, but it certainly was no glorious yeah. scoring chance or anything. And uh, he really didn't have a whole lot to do with this game, David. I'm, you know, hate to say it, but I mean, he was just not not breaking through or having much influence out there. I mean, Jason Spezza had two times a game that uh, Connor McDavid did tonight. He did. Any thoughts on any thoughts on the the whys or the how it might change or the? Uh... Well, everything was going right, right? And we talked about. I mean, game the second segment, games eleven to twenty, was the best segment. For the, I've covered them seventy seven of them over the last eleven seasons. That was the best one. The depth scores were scoring. The defense was scoring. The front line guys were scoring. The goalies were stopping. Uh, team defense was good. Special teams were good. Then they won the two games in Vancouver, and they, you know, I don't think they played as good, but they they got the two wins, and then they, and then it was like all of the things that were going well, it was like those biorhythms, you know, and they all drop at the same time, and yeah. it was everything went side, well, everything went off a cliff, on the sideways stuff. That's such a such a euphemism. Everything went down fast at the same time. And just as the best team in the Canadian division came in here playing at the out of near the top of their game, and it was just mincemeat. So, uh, so hopefully those biorhythms will come back together. But I think this will this will be this will puncture the team's confidence pretty good. Like the, how they bounce back in the next game against Calgary is hugely important. And I'm not sure if they if they're going to be able to turn it around in the two days off that they have now. Thankfully, it's you know it is two days off. They sure need a practice. <laughs> There's only two things in the NHL, Bruce: winning and misery. Yeah, well, that's from uh, the great Barry Stafford, uh, trainer of the Edmonton Oilers, the, the, who is part of more championship teams than any other person in the hockey world in the last forty years. And I he, believe the original. Saw, go ahead. Sorry, finish your thought. I'm about. I just, he saw it all. So he, he knows, and the owners are having misery right now. And, and the misery is a great impetus to change. I believe he was quoting the great football coach, Vince Lombardi, with that, with that Is that statement. right? Yeah. It, it could well two, be. Two, there... two, two things in football, winning and misery. Pretty sure that was a Lombardi. Isn't sure. his thing, there's only, <laughs> winning is the only thing. Oh, just wait. Let's yeah, yeah. This. I think that you might be, maybe okay. he said both. Yeah, well, it, it, it's certainly down his train of thought. It was a football coach who said it originally, and I'm thinking Lombardi. But anyway, it's uh, the beauties of the uh, internet era is you can find out if you're right or wrong in seconds, and usually it turns out you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. Winning. Oh yeah, he, he, the quote that he that he is famous for that I remember is winning isn't everything. It's, the, it's only the only thing, right? So uh, let me just see in the in the Lombardi quote uh, Pedia if there's misery, because because he may have said both, right? Anyway, in any case, they Bruce, this is this is the miserable moment of of the uh, you know 
of the season. I don't think it's act, what is it, act three, where, where things, everything goes wrong before everything goes right at the end of a movie. Um, I don't think we're there yet because there's lots, going to be lots more that go, goes wrong with the orders. And the only good thing I could say about this is, thank goodness this wasn't like the first three games of a playoff series. Um, this is yeah. mid-season. It's the, you know, it's the uh, March, February doldrums of the season. The orders were were riding high and they got caught off guard by a very disciplined very impressively disciplined team. And that's what that's what got me about the Leafs as compared to the Oilers, Bruce. The Oilers had all kinds of mental errors in their own zone, all kinds of defensive errors uh, f- from all kinds of players, forwards, defensemen alike. And mm-hmm. the Leafs didn't. They just, they just had that button down. And these aren't like, again, this isn't the biggest or the nastiest. This isn't the 1974 Philadelphia Flyers. This is a, you know, a team that was considered light and soft by some people. Um, in recent years, but man, they are playing great defensive hockey. And and that's what I'm left with, actually, if I'm completely honest, is admiration for the Toronto Maple Leafs, something that I rarely have felt, but my, my, my hat is off to that team. They are, they, they pl- just played fantastic hockey, the kind of hockey I would love the Edmonton Oilers to play and think they can play. And I give a lot of the credit to their coaching staff. You know, he must be really building those guys up, building their confidence, but but also teaching strong fundamental play because they just swamped the Oilers, and that is a hell of a hockey team. So um, way to go, Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. I found it. There's winning and then there's misery. For diehard fans who unconditionally support their favorite teams, there's absolutely no in-between. It's a Pat, Pat Riley, great basketball coach. It's credit and, to uh, here, anyway. Yeah. But right now, it's mis- misery and losing to Toronto and, and losing in that fashion. It's like watching the same, uh, same awful movie. It's like watching Schindler's List three nights in a row. You know what I mean? Oh. <laughs> low tide. Low tide. Had it said. That's a little bit much. Thing, I'm not, I'm not big on the on Holocaust. Tonight. <laughs> I'm not big on the Holocaust comparison. Yeah, okay. No, yeah, that's, that's probably. That's, <laughs> but it's, it's like one of those like thoroughly depressing movies yeah, that you only true. ever want to watch once that are, you know, that are, anyway. Oh, God. Have you ever seen the movie? It's like watching, it's like watching Misery three nights in a row. How's that? Seen the movie Last Exit from Brooklyn. With Kathy Bates. Well, that's bad. But have you ever seen Last Exit from It's It's a, I think his name is Herbert Selby Jr. He was the most depressing writer, American writer of the last century. Like the, the horror, the the way that the horrific side of humanity, which he portrayed, it, it, it's it's almost my it's mind blowing to, to his books. And anyway, they they made one of them into a movie called Brooklyn. I, or is that what it's called? Let me see. I'll just That's make sure I get because there's because there's a, these Kurt Russell Kirk Russell movies too, kind of the same thing. Um, Last uh, exit from New York or Brooklyn. From New York, escape from LA. Yeah, it's not. Uh, escape from Edmonton. Last exit to Brooklyn. Okay. Anyway, don't watch that movie ever because it will just. It's so Depressed. it's so sad and depressing that you never want to see it. So there you go. Yeah, well, this was uh, some parts depressing, and I guess if you want a wake-up call, well, they got three wake-up calls in a row, but I honestly want, like, the way that they didn't respond to it within the series leaves me, frankly, pretty concerned that what's, you know, what's next? Who, how do they, how do they recover from this? I, I think they do. I, 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 uh, I think they do, so. We've got lots, you know, we've got 31 games to go, and there's obviously... Uh, but there's uh, uh, that's going to be a that's it's a serious test. Let's put it that way. And they failed the test within the series, yeah, by not really solving a damn thing and for three whole games of it. So now the next test is how do you pick yourself up the mat, off the mat, or how you wily e. coyote? How do you pick yourself up uh, out of that hole in the canyon floor that you just made from falling 500 meters off? The ground? <laughs> it's a good time to, to negotiate with Darnell Nurse and uh, Ryan Nugent Hopkins as opposed to three games ago. It looked like they were each going to, you know, <laughs> break the bank. And now now it's come back to earth. The, you know, the level of the team mm-hmm. is a little bit more apparent to us all. We have a little bit more knowledge about this team than we have before. And they do about themselves as well. 
So, uh, but but I they have been Bruce a very good team up until now. They've been out chancing the opponents thirteen to ten on average. That's a very good team, and that includes four games against the Leafs. Something happened here, which was which was in- interesting and a little bit mystifying. You can't deny it though, and they're gonna they're they're, they're living it right now. Oilers fans are living it right now, and I I do see this team bouncing back. So there you have it. And I'll we'll uh, we'll we'll dig into this a bit more on Friday morning. Yeah, that sounds good. Alrighty, Bruce, any final mm. thoughts or good to go? Uh, yeah, I think it's time to move on from this this disaster and uh, prepare for whatever I comes know. next. It's you know I mean. I think we've we've spent probably 40 minutes sifting through the rubble. Indeed. (laughs) I got nothing more, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. I think I got to go watch an app. I I haven't watched Vikings season six, so that's how I'll uh, get my mind off this. Or season, whatever it is, season six and a half. I'm in the mood for Groundhog Day. At least that'll make me laugh. (laughs) (laughs) It's not a bad idea. I like, I'd like want to see some Vikings kill someone. Uh, (laughs) Okay. Uh, Bruce, thanks for talking tonight. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. Hang in there. And in the meantime, and in between times, this is another, in another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. Stop.